to an end. Actually, everything comes to an end, and including good things. And we have been having for a month now a symposium on science and technology, revolutions, revolutions and science and technology paradigms for a month. And uh, if you got a chance to be in one of the sessions or not, uh, you know what I mean by a good thing. This was a good thing. And uh, we are happy that uh, we uh, had great sessions and we couldn't find a better way to close this other than having National Instruments and David Wilson that uh, I'll be introducing in a minute. Uh, but welcome to uh, the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Science and Technology. Dr. Stephen Daniels and myself wish that this wouldn't be the last, but would be the first for many to come. I encourage you, maybe you don't dream about that, to take a copy of this for your grandkids. <laughs> because maybe 50 years from now, you'll come homecoming to Eastern and uh, walk in these rooms and see how the paint is. And you tell grandkids, I have been to the first symposium of this. So it will be kind of something uh, you remember. Uh, may I ask Dr. Stephen Daniels to give us a word about this symposium and his vision and uh, looking as the chair of physics department. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Daniels. Thank you very much, and, and welcome to the closing ceremony. Uh, this has been quite a ride. There's a lot of technology and science that, out there that has been changing the world for many, many years, and over the last month, we've gotten to hear about a number of different things that were just amazing revolutions and, and earth-changing uh, subjects in their own field and throughout, uh, throughout human history. The width and breadth of the discussions has been amazing. Uh, so many different subjects. We've touched all corners of the <coughs> university, and it's just been a wonderful symposium that uh, Dr. Wabi and well, Dr. Wabi should get much credit no. for. <laughs> it's a teamwork. <laughs> but, uh, and, but it's been a very good, uh, good thing to work with them, and we're very proud to have Dave Wilson coming in <coughs> as the sort of clean up person for this whole thing. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from that. And with that, I'll... Thank you very much. <laughs> well, here I am in Austin, Texas, in a conference called High Tech. That's the title of it. And uh, the final day and the keynote speaker, and uh, Dave Wilson as the keynote speaker and see the program. And I see the same picture you see. And I see the same screen you see. And the guy comes up, and he captures the attention of the multitude that were sitting, and uh, kept them on their toes, if you like, seeing what he has to share with them about technology and uh, what technology can do for us, and how can we use it uh, for bettering our world. So I said to myself, we want to get this guy to East. So he finishes, and I go <coughs> around and say, hi, my name is Wafiq say, hi, my name is Dave, and tell him I know. Would you come to Eastern Illinois University if I invite you? He said, sure. <laughs> and I go back uh, home, and then back uh, to off from July, and I'm sitting in my room planning for speakers, and, and I wanted Dave to be a keynote speaker for this, so I got this contact information, putting it on my desk, and uh, trying to find a phone number, couldn't find it handy. So I said, okay, I'll go to the website and find it. And guess what? You explain this to me. <laughs> the phone rings. Hi. Hi, Dr. Wabi, please speak. This is Dave Wilson of National Instruments. Hey, who? Dave Wilson. The <laughs> first thing I tell him, why are you calling at this time? <laughs> no welcoming thing. I mean, hi, uh, why are you calling at this time? I said, well, He'll tell you why he was calling, and the rest is history. So he is with us today to uh, share with us what he has on his heart. He has uh, <coughs> on his record 30 years, almost 30 years of doing this around the world. So if you name any country in the world, uh, he has been there. Actually, last week oh, he was in Switzerland. Tomorrow he will be in London or something. So if you like to send ice cream to anybody, you can send it with him. <laughs> Without much ado, Dave Wilson will come and speak to us.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lobby, Dr. Daniels. It's really a pleasure to be here. And it, it was a fun conference in Austin. And Dr. Lobby comes up and says, we're doing this symposium. We'd really like you to come and speak. And I really love to speak about technology. And I love to talk about what's possible out there and what's happening. So this is as much of a pleasure for me uh, as anything to, to, to come up here and speak to you. So I want to take you through some of the uh, some of the things that are happening out there, sort of some of the things to look forward to, and maybe set some of your expectations, some of the things that, that you can begin to expect and, and look forward to. But I'll also say, um, as I start out, we start looking back a little bit. I am now a card-carrying member of the AARP. Like, can you believe that? 50 years old, you get this, and they lowered it to 50 because they needed the dues, right? They needed the membership. So I paid my $16, and I got my card. But the lesson in that is that the time will go past. It will pass faster than you can possibly imagine. I know you don't believe it. I know it took you forever to get to where you are now in time, or seemingly, right? Moving forward, the time will pass like you will not believe. <clears throat> well, you just won't believe it. You won't believe it. So that's the first place that we start, is that the clock is ticking, and you have a certain amount of time, and it is not fine. It, it is not infinite. It's a finite amount of time. So we'll take that and we'll <coughs> blend it in with some of the things that we'll talk about with technology as we move forward. So I labeled this top step, uh, talk steps in technology and the technology design process. And as you go and begin to see the things that are happening around you, I sort of found that there's a bunch of steps and things that people typically do. And in fact, yeah, the time has passed. And, and in 1987, Actually, I was getting my first job and was beginning to, to look around and do things out there. 1985, I graduated from the university, the degree in physics. Um, and I'm sitting, was sitting in the seat that pretty much you're sitting in right now. So what did the future hold? It was a lot different for me, I can tell you. There was no, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. There were no laptops. Some of you guys remember this, right? Like, you remember it. I used to go in, in demos with software. I would carry a computer with me. Like a full-blown desktop computer I would carry with me to walk in and it didn't have a monitor. Oh, no, no monitors. You carry that too. And it should be in color, right? You know how much a color monitor weighed back in 1987? Well, it weighed probably about 20 some odd pounds, right? They used to call them cathode ray tubes. It's kind of scary. Big vacuum tube. The tube was this big. They called them Watch the tube. We actually literally watched the tube. This was really going on. So you carry all this stuff around. Times have changed. Amazing things have happened. Technology has advanced. And your, your role, your place, and the use of technology gives you unprecedented opportunities. I want to talk about that. So this is a slide called the Engineering Grand Challenges. And this is from uh, the National Academy of Engineering. And there's a fellow by the name of Charles Vest. Uh, he likes to be called Chuck. And he's, he's a guy that's had a storied career, uh, President Emeritus of MIT, and he has amazing clarity in vision. Some of the smartest people that you run into out there, the, the mark is that they can just bring clarity and simplicity to things that, that are otherwise obscured by mystifying terms and jargon that just creates this layer of inaccessibility. And people like Charles Best can just paint this picture just like he's having a normal conversation and suddenly you realize you're beginning to probe the depths of the Higgs boson. Oh, you know, you're beginning to understand it. And he is one of these types of people. Well, this is a piece of his work that came out. And, it, and from science and technology and engineering standpoint, is a very good call to action for, for science, engineering, and technology. They're the kind of things that the world cares about and wants basically science and engineering and technologists to solve. They want us to solve these problems. So as you begin to look at these things, some of the stuff like advanced healthcare. Well, you know, the healthcare thing is a big deal these days, right? It's a big deal. So are we going to be able to solve those problems? Access to clean water. You know, clean water is critically important. In fact, if you take a look at one of the biggest causes of illness and death around the world, it's, it's water. It's, it's a clean water thing. So how many of you guys have heard of Dean Kamen? Ever heard of him? You ever heard of FIRST? the Lego Mindstorm stuff. How about, how about the Segway? Are you sure? You've also, you've seen the, the mall uh, shopping, mall policemen, right? They ride those things. <laughs> the Segway, so he invented the Segway. So Dean Kamen is one of these guys, and he invented a device that you just take the end of this hose, you stick it in any water, like any water. Could be a pond, 
could be a, a toilet, it doesn't matter. And coming out the other end is pure water, the purest kind of water that you can possibly get. You can walk around, take one of his devices, stick it in any, any water source, and out comes pure drinkable water. A billion gallons a year they're able to produce. And they're little boxes that they're setting in places in Africa, and they're actually drinking water. You want a tear to come to your eye? See a small African child who's now got drinking water. Fundamental things. This is technology. This is important. And people like Charles Vester say, look, we need to find access to pure drinking water. And Dean Kamen gets a small company like Coca-Cola to come along and help distribute the machines that do this. And guess what? They have no energy there to actually pure. How do you do that? Make another little box with a small engine in it that can recycle 90% of that power and sit there and run on just small amounts of power. Tiny amounts of power. Purifying what? It's important stuff. I think you get the idea. We take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. I live in Austin. It hasn't rained there in three years. I'm getting the picture. And then we just had 12 inches of rain, right? But you get to understand this is important. And the thing that <coughs> solar energy, making that economical, it's a huge part of the energy issue that we have out there, the nuclear issues that are out there. It, restoring and improving urban infrastructure. Do you know that 25% of the bridges in America are actually in a state of disrepair? Where they're, they're pretty flush. One in four. Think about that when you go across the next bridge. Uh -oh. I'm driving across. Is that my bridge? Yeah, you're about to find out. And you've seen the headlines, right? You know when those things happen. It's relevant. And we will experience all of those things. But this is a call to action. And what they're really saying is, society is saying, we care about these things. And somebody will take care of them. Ah, they'll take care of that stuff. Well, who is they? Who are those people? And how do you get to the point where you can do what you need to do. So one of the best questions I've, I've heard, and I've talked to a lot of students, I talk to students around the globe, just continuously meeting and talking to students. And as parents, I don't know that we did the best job in my generation. In fact, one of our claims to fame is we figured out how to burn fossil fuel at a rate greater than anybody who ever came before us. Like we, we pump more hydrocarbons into the air. It's like, yeah, we can put that on our resume. Well, that's called job security for you guys. You have to figure out how to reverse all that stuff now, right? But maybe we did one thing right. And oftentimes I talk to students and they say, look, how can I make a difference? What can I do to make a difference? And interestingly enough, I thought a lot about that. The answer to the question is in the question itself. You will make the difference. You will build the difference. You will engineer the difference. Or you can sit around and hope somebody else will do that for you. But I can tell you right now, with your interest and your association with technology, you are in a position to begin to peer in to the tools and the elements that you will use to actually make that difference. You'll build it. You'll construct it. You'll understand it. And this talk is a bit about the steps in the process to making the difference. In what area, whatever area you choose. Okay. So I want to start out with, what are you going to make? <laughs> what are these things? And it's an interesting thing. There's so many different things out there, but they're, they're approaching a higher level of functionality. So that thing on the left is the, ch the base chassis for the Tesla. You know what the Tesla is? Elon Musk, SpaceX. It's an electric car that will blow the doors off any Porsche ever made. This is all electric. And 100%, you hit the throttle, 80 kilowatts, all instant torque, 100% torque at maximum efficiency. Way more than a com an internal combustion engine will do it. See, internal combustion engines make a lot of noise, right? But they don't deliver nearly the torque that that thing will. Have you ever done the YouTube videos, like the Tesla versus the Ferrari? It's almost comical. <laughs> it's not even close. Not even close. It's all. Yeah. You can just come out with uh, the hand of um, the last one. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so they're, they're, this is, and they built this motor, highly efficient motor. <coughs> they built it specifically for this. But what is that thing really? Is it just an electric motor? No. It's all the electronics. It's the batteries. It's like a bunch of, of lithium polymer batteries, or now they have lithium iron. This is crazy technology. It's all coming. But these types of things, it's really a system. 
and take a look at other things. This thing down in the lower right hand corner. You know, just think about it. I love talking about back in the day. It's like I'm hearing my father speak. He's, he's here speaking to you now, right? But like, we had flip phones. That's where it all started with us. Like, wow, I carried this bag phone around. Somebody stuck a handle on it and called it portable. That was laughable. It was this big. I bolted it to the, to the base floor of my car, right? This phone that was carried around. Well, look where we are today. Like, where we are today is you're carrying your smartphone around. You're like, well, this isn't 1080p. <laughs> Time to get a new one. It's just unacceptable. It's like, is this an AMOLED display? I don't know, it's eating too much battery life. I need a new one. It's not 4G, I've only got 3G, need a new one. These are not phones anymore. These are mobile communication systems. They're all quad core now. These are quad core computers that you're carrying on. That thing would have landed on the moon with more power than the computer they had that landed on the moon, right? And you're carrying it in your pocket and pff, no good, no good. <laughs> not meeting my needs. Incredible advances, but that's not a phone. That's a communications system extraordinary, and it's still not enough. We're still proceeding. All of these things share something in common, though, and that they're not just a function, but they're a system, a grouping of functions. So here's a guy, and I had to practice his name, Dr. Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli, and he is a professor at Berkeley. Some of you may have heard of him, and he spoke last uh, last week in Germany, and I was listening to him. And he actually put the words together that I've been looking for. I actually work in this marketing world, and he came up with this, and it was just beautiful. the ensemble is the function. And what he's really saying is this. Back in the day, when we were starting out, it was okay to take a cylinder, put a little fuel-air mixture in there, light it off, blow a piston forward, and you were down, and, and, and you were at Walmart. You know, it's like, wow, that's great. Well, that doesn't cut it anymore. That was rife with problems. All the hydrocarbon issues, right? All this carbon business going on. All of the clean air stuff that's happening. Oh, and what about safety? I told my wife, I said, I want to buy a 1965 Corvair. Well, first of all, why would anybody want to do that? I can tell you, because you want to do a lot of work on something, and be, it'd be the only one in the neighborhood with one. That's the only reason we do that. So I ended up doing this, but I, I realized, and her point was, there's no airbags in this thing. It's like, well, you know, airbags, yeah, who needs those? It's like, yeah, and, and in fact, the seats stop right here, right at shoulder level. What happens when you get rear-ended and the seat stops right here? Well, I can tell you, you don't want to be in that situation. You know how many the Newton forces involved? Like in a car, any idea? You're taking a ton of steel and you're hurling it down the road. And if you instantly come to a stop, that's the last stop you'll make. So she's like, there's no airbags in this. I'm like, ooh, I got thinking about that. And then you start feeling the dashboard. Ooh, it's like steel. It's made of steel. Oh, don't, don't hit that at 30 miles an hour. You don't want to do that. You begin to realize. So it's not enough. The fundamentals were not enough anymore. What we needed, what we needed for us, what we needed for our kids, and everyone around us, well, you know, and especially for everybody who's driving around you, you need airbags. Right? You need these things. Safety, but you don't want them to go off at the wrong time, right? I was at Ford. I used to, to be a sales engineer, and I sold and programmed with the guys at Ford Motor Company, and we're on, in one of their cars, and we we're just going to lunch, and we're in the car, and we're all talking, and the guy says, yeah, this model has a switch. You can turn the airbags off. So he's down there, he's reaching under, and we're in a light. He sits there, and he's reaching under this thing, and exact, that, that exact moment, just like the phone call, we get rear-ended, bam! And it wasn't a big but he thought the airbag was going off, you know. He's down there, boom, we get hit. And he is like, just at the exact moment, he's like, oh, I hope I don't, like, light off the airbag. And so it didn't actually go off, but it was this idea that these, these mechanisms were important to all of us. And just, just exploding a little fuel in a cylinder, that's the fundamental. It's the ensemble of those things that create the new level of expectations that we have, whether it be 1080p displays in cell phones, or whether it be all the safety systems in cars, all the advanced tracking, all of these things. This is the new expectation, and it's the new world that we enter. And he just said it beautifully. So this is a little basic chart of the kind of steps that as you participate in technology, as you participate in science, as you participate in engineering, or at least you have expectations of what that's going to do for you, you begin to get a feel for what people have to do to bring that level of functionality to you. This is the type of stuff it's going to take. 
And it starts at real fundamentals. We'll look at the theory, visualizing things, all the different ways to lay stuff out, and ultimately, how to produce stuff. And at the end of this, I also don't want you to be so impressed by the things that you see at Walmart. I want you to walk around and look at that stuff and say, I know how to do this. I can build that. It's not so impressive. Be the makers. Don't be the makees. So if you take a look at this, we'll start with theory. Now, theory is important. You've probably heard this. We have probably set you down at desks, given you pencil and paper, or maybe give you an iPad, and we have asked you to drudge through equations. Has anybody ever had that experience? We're still, like we're trying to scrub the enthusiasm right out of you. That's what we're trying to do. Well, you take a look at this, and I'll give you a little idea on theory. So theory is important, but why? And how do you begin to come to appreciate like, why should you spend any kind of time in the middle of this stuff? Like, why should you do it? What's the point? And so if you take a look at some of these, you're like, yeah, okay, maybe you've seen some of these, maybe you haven't. But I can tell you, for Dr. Daniels and Dr. Wabi, we look at these things and we start thinking, I know that equation. And it evokes all kinds of experiences and emotions and thoughts when I see the equation. And I'll relay a little one to you on this. This right here. Has anybody ever heard of this before? The <coughs> ID. This is an equation. It stands for proportional integral derivative. Now you may have seen it. It's in your car. You're using it all the time when you click cruise control. So do you really care if the guy or the gal who programmed this got it right? When you're doing 85 miles an hour and you're crusting over a hill and your cruise control set, you hope they got it right. You're sort of now bought in and committed to this person's use of the theory. When I'm at 37,000 feet over the Atlantic Ocean, I'm bought in. I am in. And these equations matter because everything that's about to happen is being predicted by those equations. And everything that just happened is being explained by them. So the theory works. And the theory is important. So I'll explain this one to you a little bit. <clears throat> Go back to this. This equation right here says the following. If I want to be at 55 miles an hour, and I'm at 45 miles an hour, what am I going to do about that? Well, if you're like some members of my family, you're going to step on the gas and go to 85. Then you're going to realize you're going too fast, and then you're going to let all the way off and go back down to 20. Do you know anybody who drives like this? Maybe not that extreme. But you know people who tend to never be able to hit the mark. But they're below the boat. And, and that's just a, so their algorithms, mental PID, is off just a little bit. It's untuned. So the next time you're in a car and that's going on, just throw this out. You're a bit untuned today, aren't you? Just a little untuned. Let me help you. Let me help you with it. But what you're going to do is when you're at 55 and you're at you're 45 and you want to be at 55, that's the difference. That's the error. You're trying to correct it. So what are you going to do about it? Well, you say, well, I'm off by 10. I'm going to multiply it by 1 and I'm going to pull up by 10. 10 newtons, 10 volts, I'm just going to pull by 10. That's a times 1. So that k term right there is a 1. Well, maybe it's not enough. Maybe I'm pulling a huge load behind me. I've got the truck loaded. I can't pull up by 1. I've got to pull up by 2. Make the k a 2. So I'll pull up by 20 or 30. I just want to barely pull up. But I'll multiply it by 0.1. So that's called the proportion. You take however far off you are, you multiply by some constant, and that's how hard you're going to pull up to correct that. That's the, that's the, the proportional term. This is the scary one. This is called the integral term. Well, what this really means is if I'm at, I'm at 54 miles an hour and I want to be at 55, I'm not really off by very much. But I'd like to correct that. But you really can't see it because it's tiny. So as you move along, you can accumulate that. Just let it build up. Every time, just keep adding the error up until you can see it. That accumulation is called integration, summing. Add those things up, and now you can see it. It's at 8, it's at 10. What do you want to do about that? Multiply by 1, multiply by 2, multiply by 3, multiply by 0.1, but you're going to pull in the opposite direction to correct it by however much you want to. That's called the I term. And then the D term is this. Wow, we only changed by one mile an hour. Yeah, and I did it in like a half a second. <laughs> that means you had a big acceleration. Whoa. 
Better slow that down. Let's not push so fast, so hard, right? So basically, what do you want to do about that? The same options, multiply by one, multiply by 0.1, by 10. So any quick jumps, you can correct instantly or quickly. And that's called the derivative or the difference. You add all these together, you get an output. And you experience it every time you turn on your cruise control. That's basically how it's doing that. And that's the equation. And it's really, you can dice that thing up into three parts. It's not that complicated. You can put it in a loop in a computer. And you can build your own cruise control. And then some, some, some of you guys will actually go out and do that for the future. So, <coughs> math. I just want to make a couple comments about math. And, and some of the, the points about it, and more of just a pedestrian look at it. But if you take a look at mathematics, we, we talk about it's a discipline. Some people get really good at it. But what I want you to understand about it is, it's a tool for you to use to turn something into something else, a way to translate. Perhaps man's greatest invention is that guy right there, the equal sign. Can you believe this? Like when you can actually prove that one thing is equivalent to another, unbelievable stuff can be pursued. And I'll give you an example, Einstein. He comes out and he pops out this little equation, E equals MC squared. What's that really say? It's saying you got speed of light, a big number, on the right-hand side of the equation. Inside of mass, if you take the energy tied up in actual matter and mass, it's an unbelievable amount of energy. And he calculates it out. Somebody says, wow, if I can split apart these two atoms, I can release by the mathematics. Nobody had done it yet, you know? Nobody had actually done it. He writes the equation. He says, wow, if I can, you can do that. You can release an unbelievable amount of energy. Well, we as mankind decided what we wanted to do with that fact. We did some good things, we did some no, not so good things. But from the energy standpoint, it held true. Like he calculated it, so hmm, what shall we do with that? Next thing you know, we have nuclear power and everything else. But it's there. So the mathematics gives you a glimpse as to what is possible. In fact, there's a guy named Michio Kaku. I don't know if you ever heard of this guy. He's a, a physicist and an, an astrophysicist at the City University of New York. And he spoke at one of our conferences about three years ago. And I was talking to him, he said, you know what? He goes, basically anything that the math tells you, unless we know of laws that we've proven that says it's not possible, anything the math tells you is not only possible, but it's, it's likely. It's actually likely to happen. Another little example. This Higgs boson thing. Have you heard of this? It's getting, this gets a little rock star step. We talk about it. But it's this particle that says it's going to tell you why matter actually has mass, why it gets weight, why gravity acts on it. It's like what this little, little thing does. So he says this, you know, to, to describe everything I'm seeing, I need an energy field that, that it lives throughout the entire universe. It's a weird model. He says, that's what I think is going on. And if it exists, if that energy field exists, there's a little particle that gets associated with every force and every part of energy, a little particle. And so he says, if it actually exists, I should be able to find it. $10 billion later, your tax money and mine, as well as the rest of the world, everybody contributed, they're smashing particles together. Right? And lo and behold, they find it. Like they find it. <laughs> now you're beginning to understand why, what gives mass to things. How gravity actually works on things. It's a step forward. So the mathematics is not worthless. <laughs> the mathematics are tools to actually give you insight about what's possible. Right? But it's also a way for you to get the things you, you need or want out of a system. So I'll give you an, an example. If I have something like a car accelerator that I'm pushing on, I say, you know what? I don't like the way the car jumps. The way this engine is, just push the accelerator a little, the car jumps. Have you ever had a car like that? I had a, what year was it, a 2002 <coughs> Honda Accord, six cylinder. In the first centimeter, in the first five millimeters of pushing the, the accelerator, the car would be like this. And I'd be like, like I, 
I, you had to get really good. Someone's like, I want to borrow the car. I'm like, okay, be careful in the first end of the year. It, it just was ridiculous. And you've had, you've had cars like this. I didn't want it to behave that way. So what do you do about that? Well, what's really happening when you press the accelerator more and more, you're not opening up a carburetor. That's not happening. You're making a request to a computer somewhere saying, you know, please, I would, I'd prefer to go now right, at this speed. And that's just, it's a potentiometer. It's a voltage level that goes into this, this computer somewhere, says I'm requesting to go at this rate. You're not actually doing it. It's fly by wire, just like on an airplane. Like you think he's sitting in there in the cockpit with cables going back to the tail rudder? No, that's not happening. It's all servo hydraulic, it's, it's fly by wire. And drive by wire is happening more and more these days, right? So anyway. My car would jump, and I, I didn't like that. I'd like to fix that. So really what I'm saying is when I push through that first centimeter or two, I don't want to deliver that much of a request. I want it to be a lower request. And then as I push further, now I want to bring it back up to what I was really asking for. What is that shape? It's like instead of going like this, I want to push, 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 keep it low. Don't, just a little bit more pushing. Okay, okay now go. Here it is right there. You see that? Right here. Normally, it would go like this, a straight line. But now I'm saying, don't deliver so much in the first push. It's called y equals x squared. That's the equation. It's a tool. It's a shape maker for what I want to have happen versus what's coming in and making the request. And all of mathematics can be looked at this way. One way to look at mathematics is go find cool functions that will be useful to you to do the kind of work for you that you want it to do. Look at it that way. Look at cool shapes of equations. So like, wow, that one behaves funny. So this one's a weird one. This is a polynomial. So in other words, it's not just y equals x squared. It's y equals x cubed squared, and then y, and then just x. So if you look at this, I've actually got a fourth, a third, and a second. What is this, cubed? What's the fourth, anybody? To the fourth x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared. And then, everything that's negative, I just turn positive. But look at that shape. And what I really said was, I want something that starts out and then drops to zero. And then in the next push, I want it to jump up again and then drop to zero. Could you imagine that in your car's accelerator? Nobody can drive your car then. Nobody can drive your car. Only you'd know well, how to drive that thing. Right? But this is the point. Mathematics is a tool, and it works for you. And it creates the shapes that you need to actually go out and do them. Okay. So what about you? How do you learn? How do you remember things? How do you study? This is some work by a guy named Dr. Dave Barrett. And he is a professor at Olin College in Massachusetts. And this guy is very interesting because he was a roboticist at a company called iRobot. Wasn't that also a movie? Maybe not so far in the future, by the way. He was also an engineer at a small company called Walt Disney. And he was in Imagineering, that's what it was called. And these guys did some of the early work. Like if you went to Walt Disney World in what, the 70s, maybe, 70s and 80s, early 80s, if you went in, you'd walk in and they'd have these things called dioramas and this whole stage would turn. And they'd have things sitting there and they'd go like this. And the mouse would and you'd hear a voice coming from a speaker in the corner. And you know what we were saying? It moved! Like, it moved! It's like amazing! And we walk and we tell all our friends that we fly to Little Disney World to see this thing go like this. And you guys would look at that and you're like, you have got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. It's the most ridiculous, the stupidest thing I've ever seen. But it started there. He started that, and this guy, with his imagination, has been actually building great robots. But importantly, he said, look, I'm a teacher now. I'm a professor. What am I in the business of? I'm in the business of building students' brains, helping them to learn. And he came up with some very important things. And I'll tell you this, because I think this could, this could be very interesting for, for all of us. So if you start here, you say, well, if we all learn at some rate, some a little slower, some a little faster, but there's an uptake in information, and you get some level of knowledge. Your professors like to test you right about here for a couple of reasons. One is you just learned it. It's when you're most likely to give information back, you get some answers right, and we all feel good about it. People got some 70s, 80s on a test, okay, most of the information is retained, I feel really good. 
Then I come in and two weeks later I said, hey, can you tell me about that PID stuff? They're like, oh no, we never covered that yet. <coughs> we haven't done anything. We, we've never, we never studied that. They're like, no, no, we did. Three weeks ago, we spent a whole week on this. You're like, no, 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 I'm certain. I've never heard of that before in my life. What's happening is your ability to retain the information decays. It decays at a pretty steep rate in the beginning. But he said, look, can I interrupt that decay? Can I actually change this for you? And he said, I think I can. And he discovered that if he can inject in at some point, preferably back in here somewhere, but at some point, if I can inject in a piece of information, an experience that makes what you just learned interesting and relevant, you're much more likely to remember it. You're much more likely to remember it. And in fact, if it has a degree of emotion attached to it, you're going to remember it way better. The point is, if you can inject experiences and emotion, things that you just learned, relevant, tangible experiences with any degree of emotion, you're going to remember it way better than if you just read it and moved on. And that makes sense. So this little picture right here, this is the airplane that one technology student built, right? Went out, spent a whole semester making it sophisticated, went straight out under the field and crashed it right into the ground. Hundreds of pieces on the ground. That's called emotion, right? And the next question is, what happened? And then the next point is, did, you know, is a sign really that important? Plus versus minus. Like, how important is it? I get the whole problem wrong on a test because I put a plus versus a minus. Is it really that important? Ask this guy. This guy will tell you. <coughs> when you're calculating up and down in your PID equations, the minus counts. It counts. And I guarantee you, we'll never forget it. Let me give you another. That was sort of the medium, maybe the low cost of education. Here's another low cost of education story. We had an intern come in, takes an LED, and I said, would you test these out for me? Anybody ever plugged an LED in anything? A couple of you have. Light emitting diode. I said, would you test these out for me? Because I want to, we're going to solder them onto boards, and I want to make sure they're good before I put them on. So I come back an hour later, he's got a pile of them on the table. He said, you're not going to believe this. Every one of them's bad. Every single one. I'm like, well, statistically, that's impossible. It's just impossible. They can't all be bad. Two or three could be bad, but not all of them. He said, no, 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 check this out. Let me show you. He takes the LED, sticks it on the battery terminals, and it goes, gone. <laughs> and then I had to explain to him about something called a current limiting resistor. Go try this. Take an LED, stick it right up to a battery. Just like that. It'll drive that current through unrestricted, burn it straight up. You have to put a resistor in line. And he felt really bad about that. I said, well, the good news is they're only four cents a piece. Right? That's called the low cost of education. I guarantee he will never hook up an LED for the rest of his life without putting the current limiting resistor in there. It's a guarantee. He knows that better than any of us now. He's like an expert in it. He get his PhD in it. But the point is, if you can interrupt this decay curve, I'm telling you right now, if you can interrupt the decay curve with some basic experience, you're going to remember a lot more on that piece of theory. And this was mine. I built an electric bicycle, and then I got this great idea. Cruise control. Oh, yes. Cruise control. I'm the electric bicycle. I can do this. And so sure enough, I did. I built this thing. And I'm cruising down the road, and I'm setting things. Now the intersection's coming. You know what comes to mind? I'm a little out of tune here. My equation is a little untuned. <coughs> and I'm going to stop, and now it wants to correct. It's going, and it's overshooting. And I'm starting to lunge on this thing. I'm heading toward the intersection. I'm like, how do I explain this to my wife now? And I got the integral term, a little, little hot on the integral term, you know, a little untuned. No, that's not going to fly. No, that's not going to fly. So I ditched this thing. But I bonded with PID on that day. Oh, there's no doubt. I'm always looking to tune and figure out better ways to tune PID. Because when you use it in something that's an emotional experience, you're going to remember it. So keep that in mind, especially when you're studying. Look at things that you're doing and say, how can I relate this? Ask that of your professor. What's the application of this? Can I try this? How do I experience this? If you can do that, you're going to remember those things. You'll remember those things. So visualize the theory. We're taking steps in now how people go and interact and begin to use technology. Do you remember sitting in class, maybe in sixth grade, I don't know, and the teacher's talking, and you're drawn in the corner of your notebook, and you're drawing the car. You put the 
big rocket on the top with the flames coming out of it. Do you remember that? I mean, have you ever drawn the rocket ship? I don't know. Like you're drawing the catapult. You're going to build this thing in the backfield. Some of you are going to launch something out there. What are you really doing? You're kind of communicating to yourself what you're interested in. This is when you can escape and nobody's watching. This is what you're building. Visualizing the things that you'd like to create is very important. So I do a little bit of this. Um, these are just some really crude drawings. You can do it way better on, on pen and paper, right? Like way better. It's got an instant boot time. Yeah. It never, it, it's, it's cheap, except, you know, we're trying to do other things. So I just did this on my, my iPad and I was drawing stuff on it. But what you're doing when you, this is a little wordier and a little linear stage, stuff I kind of mess around with. But what you're doing is communicating with yourself what you're interested in. And it's sort of the do part of doodle. It's kind of no, no surprise to me that do is actually in the word doodle. But when you're drawing things and you're putting things down, and so I encourage you to do this. Keep a notebook where you do nothing but doodle and put little pictures in there and things. Any notes. And it doesn't have to be for any other purposes of recording the stuff that you find interesting. And ways that you might modify it. Ways you might change it. Ways you might do it. Put those things in there. Right? So let's look at the master doodler of all times. This guy. <coughs> Thomas Edison. I was just at Rutgers in New Jersey. And I was speaking in the same place that they're pulling all the papers that the master doodler created. They got a whole cache his stuff in there. And this is what one of it looks like. This is some of the stuff he was writing down. Now, the first thing that's interesting on this is he titles this Things Doing and To Be Done. Meaning he hasn't done them yet. Look at the confidence this guy had to write stuff down that we already know changed history, right? We know had an impact on history beyond probably even his wildest dreams. He had confidence and perhaps audacity to actually go and do this stuff. And you look at some of these. So new standard phonograph, right? Well, back in the day, you guys aren't going to believe this. There was things called LPs that were pressed out of vinyl that actually had little, little vibrations melted into them that when you, you drag this, this crystal stylus around it, would vibrate. And we would listen to that stuff. Right? This is what this guy was doing in the early 1900s. And he said, I want to do that. I want to build that. So there's one of his things. A cheap dynamo, something that actually will generate power. That makes sense, right? That would be good. An apparatus for the deaf. He was actually interested in helping people who couldn't hear. And he says, I want to build something like that. The electric piano. Wow. That's interesting. He's back in the day. You know, people are tuning these things. And he's like, I think I could make that electric. Unbelievable, right? Telephone coils. Here we go. A good battery for the telephone. <coughs> well, if, if Edison failed at anything, it's that right there. Because my cell phone won't even last a full day, right? So I don't have a good battery. But actually, he, he advanced us quite a bit, right? He advanced us quite a bit. When you think about it, in fact, the battery in my phone, the reason I picked it, it's got a 3,300 milliamp hour battery. You know what that means? I can go almost two days on the charge. But it ain't a week. <laughs> and I'd really like a week, right? It goes on and on. He wrote all of this stuff down. What gave him the confidence? First of all, the interest, right? He had to be interested. But what it gave him the confidence he could even pull this off? And I'll show you his secret. Here it is. This is called his Menlo Park Laboratory. It's not in California, by the way. It's in New Jersey, right? It's in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Not Menlo Park. <laughs> and in fact, I've seen people actually put things up, come to Menlo Park, you know, the home of Edison. And it's coming from California. I'm like, that's not right. That's wrong. So don't go there. Go head east if you want to see this thing. The point is, he went and collected all of these materials and he put them in a room. And when he'd have an idea, he'd say, you know what, I want to give that thing a shot. I want to try this thing out. And by that afternoon, he'd be in there doing things. I'll bet you he burned up all kind of tungsten filaments. One after another. He had a pile probably as big as my intern had LEDs. Right? Before he figured out, maybe I should use a vacuum. Maybe I shouldn't have air around the tungsten filament when it's burning. And if I could do that. And so then the shape of the light bulb came. Because it's a vacuum chamber. 
it, it doesn't have that shape for the same reason that a Coke bottle has its shape. The Coke bottle shape was pure. Maybe it was pressure. But I think it was pure style. The light bulb has a shape because it's functional, and he needed that shape to hold the vacuum so that he could put tungsten filaments in it so it wouldn't burn out. So he figured. But he was doodling with this stuff. He was experimenting. He was iterating on this stuff. And iterating quickly, experientially, so that he could produce something. Your ability to, ex to, to actually iterate on things quickly, some people like to call it fail forward, but it's not a fail, the, the fail forward's not even applicable. You are experimenting, you're trying, you're testing, you're moving forward. And basically what you're doing, you're learning. So this is a picture of a controls and mechatronics robotics laboratory at Virginia Tech. And Dennis Hahn is a guy with a lot of passion to go out and put together these systems. And on theirs, they do a lot of the mathematics, and then they try it out, and they iterate on the concepts. Okay, I want to talk to you about the steps now. Good, that's visualization. I want to talk to you about the steps of actually beginning to create this. And this is almost a little arts and crafts. You're going to recognize a lot of the stuff in here. And it's steps to get you to take your ideas and begin to try them. So, how many have been to Harbor Freight? Has anybody here been to Harbor Freight? A couple of us have. And you know, when you walk through Harbor Freight, the first thing that strikes you is like, wow, tools are really cheap now. Tools are inexpensive. And I'll walk you through some of my favorite tools, but look at the price of some of these. A rotary hammer drill, $69. Six and a half horsepower gas engine, 99 bucks. That seems reasonable to me, right? It's a different time. This stuff was way expensive relative to the value of the dollar back in the day. So here's one of my favorite tools. Do you recognize this? He knows it. You know what this thing is called? Anyone? Anyone? Under 50. <laughs> it's not a slide rule. Right? It's not a slide rule. We all know. This is a vernier caliper. Mm. And I illustrate this to show you how inexpensive things have gotten. So this company right here is VBX.com bearings, which, what does that have to do with uh, vernier calipers? Well, you can measure diameters, right? Things like that. But the idea of this is you slide this thing apart, you get a reading, a little arrow matches up and it gives you your primary number. And then there's a little graduated markings, and they only match up one at a time. Some of them will be off, and one will match. And that's the fractional distance. You can construct fractional numbers pretty accurately with this scheme. Really cool, right? Back in the day, Vernier calipers were expensive. I don't know if they were like 30, 40, 50 bucks, but they were a, a lot, and that's why I didn't have them. I'm checking out a VBXBearings.com, and it asked me this. Would you like to pay $2.99 for your own Vernier caliper? And I'm like, is that even a question? Like, of course I would. This thing has got a digital display on it. I don't have to match up little hash marks now. I can push this button, and I can go from inches to millimeters. And I just sit there for hours at a time. Because it's a miracle to me. It's in that little box. You pull this thing back, you get a reading, and you go back and forth. <coughs> Unbelievable. You guys can take that for granted, but I don't because I used to have to read those little hash marks. Here it is. I bought that thing. That's one of my favorite tools. It's cheap. Does anybody know what this thing is? <coughs> anybody? Under, under 50? <laughs> what is that thing? Hacksaw. It's called a hacksaw. Exactly right. The miracle about the hacksaw is it can actually cut a piece of metal. It's like, like, really? Like, yeah, really? You can cut through a steel pipe with a hacksaw. And then you kind of rub your, your finger over the end of it. It doesn't seem that sharp. The little teeth in there will cut through steel. And yet, guess how much those things are? Go to Home Depot. Any idea what that thing costs? $4.99. They put them in these bins on the way out. And they're like, Got these things on special. Then you walk by that, and when my wife isn't looking, I grab one and throw it in the cart. How can you pass up a hacksaw for $4? It's just unbelievable. That's available. Basic fundamental things. If you're going to build stuff and make stuff, you probably need one of those. This is the Mighty Grinder. Now, you may or may not need this thing. You can do a lot of shaping with this. These are more expensive because this is that big motor right here, and you they don't give those away. They still have big metal parts in it, windings in it. All kinds of things like that. These are probably the $150 range. This is perhaps my favorite tool. The belt sander. You know what a belt sander costs nowadays? $79.
Remember back in the day, belt sanders had never, this is a multi-hundred dollar, two, three hundred dollar device sitting there. You can buy it for 79 bucks. My point is, you can begin to outfit yourself to play around with <coughs> things, and a, you know, $500, which you can have a lot of stuff in your shop. The Mighty Drill Press, indispensable, 129 bucks. This may be my favorite tool. It's a table saw. It's got a four inch blade on it. It's not that big. Take little pieces of plastic, zip it through there, right? $35. I got that under my, my tree, right? It was cheap. I use it all the time. The point is, if you want to start participating in these things, it's not, it's not that expensive. The Mighty Glue Gun, and I'll show you what this is great for. The glue gun holds things like acrylic plastic together incredibly well. It's actually hard to get apart, and it's, it's pretty instant to do. The other thing I, I should put in there is the solder gun. I don't have it in there. Different tool, but it's a, a great tool. Has anybody ever been to this website, McMaster Car? McMaster Carr is Thomas Edison's laboratory from a materials standpoint. Everything from acrylic plastic to bearing. Does anybody know what a thrust bearing is? No idea. When you took a, a pipe and you want to set it vertically on something and have it spin around, it's got to be on, on a roller bearing sitting at the bottom of it. That's called a thrust bearing. It took me days. To, I wanted to build something. I built my own transmission. I needed a thrust bearing. Where was it? I didn't know that's what it called. If you Google long enough, it'll finally find you. Now you go to McMaster Car, you type in thrust brain, boom, they all pop up. So you spend some time just orienting yourself. But places like McMaster Car has all kinds of stuff. And then you start building. So now, now we're getting into the manufacturing idea. And I want to give you an example. I'll bet you don't know what a plophysmograph is. I didn't know. This is an interesting thing. Every single time your heart beats, the blood courses through all of your veins, all of your arteries, and if you take a look at your finger, hold it up to the light, you will actually darken up and lighten up. With every heartbeat, like this is really working. This isn't, you know, you don't, it's like you can see the mechanics of the body work. And you shine an LED through your finger, you put a photodiode or a phototransistor on the other side, you can measure the light difference in the tip of your finger with every heart. What an amazing system. We were just talking that before, that human body. You had to build this machine, ha, that's hard to do. But you can observe it. And so I wanted to build something to see how biomedical people do this. Like, what's the technology behind biomedical? Well, there's a fundamental one, a plethysmograph. It's a big name that just basically says we'll measure the light that's absorbed by blood pumping and then going away. Right? So I started with this little, little acrylic tube. I cut it with the hacksaw, by the way. Right? I took this piece on the bottom. It was already cut out. I found it. Otherwise, I would have cut that with the hacksaw. And now I'm ready to build it. And I want to start replicating. So keep that in mind <coughs> if I want to build it. So the first thing I said was, look, I don't want to make just one. And another thing I'll tell you as you get involved with technology, you're likely to be able to do one thing in your house and the moment you go to show somebody, it will never work in front of anybody. Like, you're like, no, but it worked. You're like, okay, we'll bring it back <laughs> when it works again. So oftentimes you want to do it two or three times or four times or replicate things and put them in front of a bunch of people to find out, did it really work? Was it just my imagination? So we'll talk about replication. This is, this is uh, mold making. Has anybody ever built a mold? It took me like 45 years before I ever did this for the first time. Don't let that happen to you. So in fact, do you guys know who Johnny Ives is? Johnny Ives. He's one of the big designers at Apple. Like half of you guys are carrying around his designs in your pocket, the, the iPhone, right? This whole thing. So Johnny Ives, but the point is he makes these really cool looking organic, nice touch feel stuff. And it seems like only Johnny Ives and a, an $80 billion company like Apple or whatever they have could possibly do something. It's like, no, 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 it's not the case. You can start to do this yourself. And I want to walk through that a little bit. So building molds is cool because you can actually go and replicate things. This particular example is not the best. I'll show you another one because they ruined the mold when they took it apart. Right? So I'll show you some that actually the molds are reusable. But there's something called room temperature vulcanizing rubber. Now, this is not a substance out of Star Trek, by the way. It's got nothing to do with Spock. It is a material that they, it's a process actually, 
and a rubber material that they use in your, in your tires, in your cars. And it's very tough, right? very rugged. We use it all the time. Well, this material is actually available for you to build things with, like, like molds. And so here's what it looks like. You take part A and part B and you mix it up. It looks like, I don't know, used to, it's like, like marshmallow, like the, the liquid marshmallow. It looks like that. You pour it in. No, I'm not going to try it, but it looks like that. You mix it up, you dump it in there, and you wait four or five hours. And you come back. And it's cured at this point. Now, on this, this example, I took a piece of plastic, I glued down a couple parts, and then I poured the, the RTV, room temperature vulcanizing rubber. I poured it over it, came back five hours later, and I pulled this thing out. This is what it looks on the other side. <clears throat> so I needed these little parts and pieces. There they are, just simple little parts and pieces. You go through, you take your scissors, and you clean up all this mess. This is like a dog tag type of thing here. I wanted that. And then, now I need to, now I have the mold. So now I got I want to build the parts. I want to replicate those things. Here's my other mold. Do you know what that's a mold for? I put this yeah. I took the hot glue gun and I glued that tube down to that base. But if I hit that thing with a hammer, the glue the hot glue is not going to hold up to that. Once I get done making this thing, it'll hold up, and then I can actually make multiple of these things. This will be one piece, and it'll be strong. There's my mold for my plethysmograph. I still have that mold. Now I want to clear the, 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 the material in it and create it. So there's a bunch of materials out there. You've heard of epoxy and you've mixed epoxy, probably glues together. How long does it take epoxy to dry? Some of them's pretty quick. Some of them take days or hours. I don't have that kind of patience. And in fact, I wanted to iterate more quickly. This stuff I found is called alumolite, and this is called a thermal cast resin. When you mix this stuff together, it's actually gonna, it's gonna harden up. You mix it, part A, part B, you pour it in your mold, you pull it out, and you get something that looks like this. If you let your aluminum sit for a year after you open it up, it'll get moisture in it. You see those little bubbles type of it? It'll actually boil it. <laughs> and that's what's happening. You get the new stuff, it'll be, it'll be really small. You pour this in the mold, you pull it out five minutes later. 20 minutes as hard as can be, but you can de-mold it in five minutes. You got the part in your hand. And in an hour, you can have five or six parts. You can also embed things in there, you put little electronic components in there. So it looks kind of cool, and in fact, there's what it looks like. The original, and the one you can hit with a hammer and replicate. You can build parts for a car, you can build parts for a phone. You can create, and the neat thing is you can iterate fast on this stuff. It's called a thermal cast resin, and I started using it. It comes in black, it comes in white, and then it comes, you can add, it's clear, you can add colors to it. Really cool stuff. But it's a technology that's out there for iterating. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about electronics. Because in a system, when you design a system, you'll be associated with mechanical. You're going to have to do electrical things too. You don't have to be an electrical engineer. But you should gain a basic, fundamental understanding of what the elemental components of electronics are. Primarily so that you can set expectations for yourself and others. So, you can buy parts everywhere. They're inexpensive. You can get them all over the place. Here's some that are sort of my favorites, and little things that maybe you want to experience and know, some basic things. So, a resistor. And in fact, when you start goofing around with electronics, you start saying to yourself, but resistor, like, why do I really need a resistor there? When you start blowing things up and burning things up, and you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't hook that voltage right to the ground plane. Something should be in the middle of plus and minus. And in some form or another, it's going to be some element of resistance to hold those two apart. You always have to do that. So the resistor serves that as well as a plethora of other options and functions. <clears throat> But that's something that's nice. The diode's a one-way valve. And you can imagine that can be very helpful. Right? Very helpful. But here's a special kind of diode called the Zener diode. And this is, this is where it gets obscure until you find a use for it. And you're like, what am I going to do? Like, why do I, like, seriously, do I need a Zener diode? It's like, well, let me tell you. When you want to go and hold a voltage at some level, Zener diodes are really good. Because typically they won't let a voltage through. They're a one-way valve. They're going to hold it off. 
But a zener valve will hold it off, but only to a certain level. And then once it hits that level, it'll start, it'll start conducting. So it can hold things at a volt. It's a voltage level clamp. It can hold it at three volts or five volts or eight, <coughs> eight volts, but it's a way to actually go and set levels. So now it's not a zener diode to me. It's a voltage clamp and it's a tool. And it lets me set levels and I just throw them into circuits wherever I want them to be. I just throw them in. I can use them now because I understand why in the world Mr. Zener ever got to be so famous. Because he is so useful in the middle of your circuits to set voltage levels. You, you'll come across it. I need 5.5 volts, put one of those in there, and that's what it's going to be. All right, so you get used to that. The capacitor, capacitors are interesting. You get noise. Like when you run a motor, a little DC motor, like in one of the hobby cars or anything, these things are made to spew out electrical noise. Like if you have a speaker, you're going to hear these things. Do you ever remember, I know we remember, in our cars we drive along, and we would hear the engine noise in the radio, right? Because the electronics opening and closing, little motors opening and closing, little switches, they're making electrical noise that will just ruin everything. In fact, there are all kinds of standards now that say, that make you promise in a product, oh, my product will not spew out electrical noise and mess up everything else around it. You actually have to make that promise and certify that to sell a product in the open market. So how do you fix that? Well, the capacitor is a great filter. It can either take those really high frequencies and send them straight into ground and get rid of them, or it can let them pass through. Or it can take big DC offsets that you have that are rolling and get rid of those or let them through. And they're cheap. I mean, these things are in the pennies for this. So you can write big computer programs to filter all that stuff out. And sometimes you're like, well, I could program for days. And or I could drop in a 29 cent capacitor and be done with it. <laughs> it's useful. It's a tool. And you put it in the middle of things all the time. The, the LED, I've already talked about that. We know all about those and how to burn those up now. Um, the TIP120 power transistor, this is like a water faucet. You turn this little thing, and the fireman pulls the hose back. He can pull that back with a reasonable amount of force, and he can blow out a wall with the water pressure. That's what this guy is right here. Right here is called the base. You put a little voltage into this thing, and then it begins to draw power from the big source, voltage source that you have, and then it cranks it out the other side called the emitter. It's a tool. When you actually have to go control a motor with a little knob, you use one of those. You put it in there. And then finally, the H-bridge. I can tell you this. At some point in your life, you're going to really reverse the direction of a motor. <coughs> it's going to happen. Motor's running clockwise. I'd like it to go counterclockwise now. That's called an H-bridge. They sell them. They're cheap, they're probably 50 cents or a dollar, depending on how much power they'll, they'll handle. You drop it in, you throw a little switch, and it'll turn the motor's direction the other way. It's called an H-bridge. You'll run into it, it's something that you should know about. And then you start doing stuff like this. You know, it's interesting because coming from a physics background, I wasn't an electrical guy that I just wanted to go draw circuits. But what I'm telling you is eventually you're going to need a circuit in something. So you start doing the most basic things. The most fundamental things. And I could say, well, just go home and build a voltage divider tonight. And I'm like, I prefer, I got other things to do. I'm not going to do that. But at some point, you're going to have 12 volts and you're going to want 6 volts. You're like, all right, I'll just build a little a voltage divider and see if I can get 6 volts. Start there. And then you'll realize, wow, but I need to draw power. Like, oh, you can't draw that kind of power through this resistor. You know how you'll know that? It'll get hot and burn up on you. Like, oh. Well, at least you made a step. Now you need to actually control it. You'll put the power transistor in line with that six volts and let it handle the load. But take those steps. Take those steps in a direction. And you'll begin to discover the necessity of these pieces. The necessity will come in the form of burned out things and smoking and lights blowing up. But you will begin to bond with the issues. The second thing I'll tell you is you're carrying around with you unprecedented power. We built a little box like this. In fact, I have one here. I'll show it to you quickly. This is called MyDAC, but companies like mine, we build little boxes and we sell them to people. This little box is all about taking signals in, sending signals out, whether they be analog signals or digital signals, right? And it's got a voltmeter in the end of it. And this is a little box to do those things. What does it look like when you use it, though? The software can give this a personality that may actually look familiar or should look familiar at some point in time. 
you plug this thing into your computer and you start doing this kind of stuff. This is a little piece of software that comes up and says, I want to generate a waveform. And I want it to sinusoidally go up and down at some rate. Well, it's called a function generator. And your software in your computer will turn that box into a function generator. Now we start keeping a tally of what equipment used to cost, and it's gotten a lot cheaper. But back in the day, that was a box that sat on top of the, 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 the lab bench, and it was in the, the $100 range or something like that. And real good ones that are really accurate cost quite a bit more. So you got one in your computer. The software will turn that thing into a function generator. And now I sound like the sham wow guy. But wait, there's more. There's more to this. The next thing is the digital multimedia. Well, you probably should have one of those. These are interesting. When you go to Harbor Freight, that's the other thing. You're going through the checkout, the impulse buy. Now, only a technologist could be caught in an impulse buy picking up a digital multimeter. But if it ever happens to you, you have arrived. You are, you're there. You're in the club now. This is a digital multimeter. By the way, if you buy that at Harbor Freight, on special, you know how much those are? They're like three ninety nine on special. It's digital <coughs> multimeter. You just plug it in. Unbelievable. Three ninety nine is crazy. Um, your computer will do the same thing though, and there it is. That's what it looks like: volts, ohms, amps, diode checks, all this stuff. But there is one: oscilloscope. Have you had a chance to be in a lab and play with an oscilloscope? The scope is basically saying, look, something's going on in the circuit. The motor's running. Everything's jittering over here. Every time I run the motor, what's going on? I got a clean signal. I turn the motor on. You put the probe on it. You saw the signal that you sent in, the accelerator pedal signal that you were sending in. It was a nice three volts or four volts. Turn on this little windshield wiper motor. And that's, that's showing up on your accelerator pedal input signal. It's like, why does the car shudder every time I turn on the windshield wipers? That's why. That noise is coming off that motor right into your computer and is controlling the throttle now. You can't see that without a voltmeter or without an oscilloscope. You take your oscilloscope, you'll put it on there, and you'll see the waveform come up. Oscilloscopes have gotten a lot cheaper over time, but they're still about this big. Your computer has an oscilloscope in it through the software. It's the same thing that looks just like that. It's got knobs with uh, volts per division and time per division. You're carrying one of those around with you today. But wait, there's more. This is called a dynamic signal analyzer. This is crazy stuff. Interesting stuff, though. You're driving down the road, and you're feeling a vibration in your car. Where is it coming from? Only one of a thousand possible sources. It could be bearings in your wheels. It could be a gear in your transmission. But if you have any of the specifications, you can say, I'm going to measure the vibration in this car, and I'm going to look at them all. And that waveform at the bottom would be a combination of all the possible vibrations in the car, all of them. And what this device will do is go in and say, I'm going to let you break those out, show you what's happening at one cycle per second, two cycles per second, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 50 hertz, 1,000 hertz. I'm going to show them up to you. I'll put this, if there's a vibration at 1,000 cycles per second, I'm going to put a spike right there, and I'll show you. The type will be how much it's shaking you. Right? That's what that thing shows you. Back in our day, that was a ten dollars to $15,000 device. And you could only look at it in the lab. You could never actually touch it. You needed a licensed expert to run that thing. It's now in your computer. Your software in your computer gives you that device in your hands today. You have it right there. Now you can go and read these vibrations, and if you know that third gear rotates at a certain rate at 55 miles an hour, you'll see a spike right there, and you can tell if third gear is a little out of tune, if it needs balanced or not. You can probe into the inner workings of an engine or a transmission without taking it apart. You can mod monitor the health of every single bearing and gear if you know what speeds they're turning at, because they'll show up here as how well they're tuned. So let's talk about building things in production. The technology that's coming along to do this. You recognize that thing? Anybody? <clears throat> that is not a microwave oven. <laughs> but someday it might actually print your lunch. Right? It's a, three, a 3D printer. Yep. So, yeah. Yep, you've seen it, right? So this is, this is like a 3D printer. And a 3D printer is one of the, it's really exciting. Because now you take your programs and you, you doodle. 
and a CAD program. You need CAD programs. They're cheap online now. Some people just let you download them, trial versions for free. You draw circles and squares and things that look like knee joints. You send it into this device, and it will hand you the part out. And it works like the hot glue gun. That's how these things work. It takes plastic, I think it's um, ABS plastic. They heat the tip, and it pushes it down. It feeds it down in, and it's coming out the bottom. And you move it, and then it moves this head back and forth, and then it brings the bottom away from it. And it builds up a part, like any part. They're printing all kinds of crazy things with these devices now. So they're all, all about it. This is about a $25,000 device. This one, this one is about a $1,500 device. It takes a little bit of your own time, but you can build your own 3D printer. You're getting down in the $1,000 range now. Now you go in with your buddies. <laughs> and you buy them. But you begin to build anything that you can envision. And they're getting sophisticated. They actually have multiple print types or material types. So they'll print one with the ABS plastic and another one they'll use with a material that's dissolvable. And its purpose is to hold the ABS in place. You build this whole thing, you take it apart, you dump it in a solution, you pull it out, and you get a crescent right <coughs> with all the moving parts, all put together because it dissolved all the materials out between the places you didn't want it from that dissolvable material part. <clears throat> so this is exciting, and this is coming our way. You'll find them all over the place now. <coughs> Gain an experience with this, even if you don't buy one. There's tech shops, universities have these things now. Go find one, get a little time on one, and just get familiar with what is possible. So that as you're involved with things in the future, you at least have that as a reference. One of the things I want you to discover is how long it takes to print the average part. Because sometimes that takes time. It takes time to print a part. And you, you may or may not have that kind of time. You print a big part. Let me tell you a quick story. I was at Yale, and they bring this 3D part out to me. And you know what it is? They did an MRI image scan of a 21-year-old guy's knee, and he had a bone cancer tumor right here. And they're going to operate on this thing. They MRI imaged this thing. They fed the data into the $25,000 one, right? And about a day and a half later, they come back with the knee, the bone, with, in a different color, the tumor in a different color. And they took it to the surgeon, and they said, here's his knee. Approach it how you will. He said it changed his whole approach. He was going to operate in one way, and now he decided to operate in another. Unbelievable. They're <coughs> taking the nerves, the neurons in the brain, imaging those, enlarging them, and handing it to you and say, here's what that neuron looks like. And they can see neurons in, in brain damage cases and in normal cases. They can hand you the neuron. Unbelievable. 3D printing is coming. The only drawback in my mind is how long it takes to get the part. Right? So there's, there's another type of um, manufacturing that's available to you, and it's called um, laser cutting, and I'll show you this. This is a CAD package right here. So if you've ever played with a CAD package, um, it's sort of like uh, a PowerPoint in a way. You can draw shapes in PowerPoint. They're more sophisticated. This is a little gear template generator. And what's kind of nice about making your own gear, so you can have any gear you want with any number of teeth that you want, uh, and you can have them pretty quickly. And here's another, uh, this is a package called TurboCAD. Um, you can buy this, like used for 29 bucks. <laughs> online. You can download free evaluations of it. Just play with it. Get an idea. Stress these things out. Just get it. It's pretty simple. Within a day, you'll be actually somewhat proficient in something like this, right? So building this stuff out. Now you're going to make this stuff. This is where it gets interesting for me. This is a laser cutter. And laser cutters can be expensive. This is a $50,000 laser cutter. But you can go to shops, some universities have them, right? You can go to, there's, there's things called tech shops that are popping up across the country now, places like this, maker spaces and stuff. And they'll have these, you can get a little time on one of these for cheap. And you can cut out parts and pieces. This is not a drawing. This is a laser cutting through a sheet of quarter inch acrylic plastic. And that's what the big sheet looks like. This will take about 20 minutes to do all of those, 20 minutes. When you're done with this, you pick up that sheet of plastic and you start tapping on it, and all the pieces fall out in your hands. And the biggest job is peeling off the, pla the, the paper, sticking to the acrylic. That's the, that's the painful part. But you're sitting there with all these gears now and all these pieces, and you put it together and you make something that looks like that. We're so excited, we get these ideas, we put them down, we go into the laser cutting shop. 
We run this thing out. And we cannot wait to put these things together. I mean, here it is. Here's the pieces. And it's semi-rugged. You can actually go carry this stuff around. And you make this. This, this by the way, is a roll chassis dynamometer. So when you're taking your car or your motorcycle, you want to see how much horsepower it puts out. This is a miniature version of it, a real small dyno that I can actually measure energy capacity of things and also the little power output of my small cars. Right? I wanted to build it. I built it. There it is. Electronics, the same deal. We make something called Multisim. You can download an eval of this. I think you can own it for like 30 or 40 bucks. Draw your circuits out. What's kind of cool is you just draw them out. Take a couple resistors, pump a sine wave into it, put a capacitor on it. And now you can probe around it with little oscilloscopes in here. And you can see what the, what the circuits do. You can see the basic thing. And this is interesting because once you get that circuit, you may or may not ever do this, but it's cool to do it if you've ever get the chance. You can actually, with this companion product of this, there's a bunch of uh, pieces of software that do this. This is called Multiboard. You actually go and you start putting the wires down. And you should do it with actual wires and prototype it out. And after a while, you're like, oh, you know, more wires, more wires. You'd like to make a circuit board, especially if you're going to give it to somebody else. Send it away to somebody like this, advanced circuits, for 20 or 30 bucks, they'll, they'll print you out several circuit boards. And then you get this thing in the mail, and it comes back. And the first time you get a circuit board back, you know what you think? You think, wow. You know, not only Steve Jobs and Apple and, and GE, they're not the only ones that can actually produce electronics and circuits. You know, for the 20 and $30, in fact, some boards are five or 10 bucks, depending on quantities. You can produce your own circuit board. And you should do it just so that you're not impressed by everyone else who does it. Because there, it's nothing magic. They're not in an exclusive stuff. Like, this is not, like, the internal combustion engine, or maybe even the hybrid electric engine, that's sort of an incidental now. Every, you're just surrounded by a, a whole array, a series of processors. So you have to program things, or they won't work anymore, and you have to get into that. So the question is, how do you program? And one of the National Instruments, what we've done, which is a unique thing, we've taken some cues from the graphical development of the CAD stuff, the show we're laying out gears and parts, right? And the graphical development of circuit layout and design. And we've applied it to a programming approach that we call LabVIEW. Have any, has anybody ever heard of LabVIEW here? Okay, so now you heard it for the first time. It's a graphical symbolic programming language that has the capabilities of just about every other programming language. It's just that you approach it with pictures and graphics and symbols. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that. So when you're going to build a system, you need the math, you need different ways of approaching it with programs, and you need to be able to reach out, send signals out like to our throttle, and tell it to move, and then read it back to see if it did. You need to be able to actually interface with it yourself. Humans still need to be in the middle of these systems. We haven't gotten that far yet. So that's called the user interface. You gotta be able to put it out on targets, meaning a little box that you can put your program in and put it out in a car or up on a wind turbine or in a greenhouse where you're growing food. You have to be able to do that. And then this right here, you've got to be able to use different technologies. So I want to couple, throw a couple terms at you because you're going to hear these in the technology world. First one is multi-core processing. You've probably heard that, right? It made its way into your house. If you're carrying probably multi-core in your pocket, your laptop's at least a dual core now, and maybe a quad core, right? These, these arrived one day. So that's a technology that you're using. Another technology is called the field programmable gate array. And if you haven't run into this, you will. You're using them in your televisions right now. So this is a chip. It's a piece of silicon. It's a chip that gets its functionality defined by burning that functionality in. And then you can erase it and reburn new functionality in. So they'll put it in phones. They'll put it in televisions. Because if you buy a new TV and a new decoding scheme arrives that all the manufacturers, all the cable networks want to push out, can your TV handle it or not? Blu-ray's another case. You know, the Blu-ray format. You ever see that when you're watching the movie? It's like, this Blu-ray player adapts to the Blu-ray format, which may be modified at any time, rendering your Blu-ray player useless. Have you seen that at the bottom of, have you seen it? You rented a movie, it says that. It's like, wow, that could happen. How do they mitigate against that risk? Well, they can put a field programmable gatorade in there that they can re-burn the piece of silicon, and it'll adapt to whatever. It's a reprogrammable 
integrated circuit chip. Field, programmable, gate, array. And that's what this other technology is. You may or may not ever program one. You may. And I'll tell you some things about it as well. If you're going to program it, and you're going to write a bunch of text, we claim it takes a bunch of time. And so, if you can do the following in a system, make sure all of these pieces will actually work together. Guarantee me that. Make sure that they can all communicate with each other. Make sure the data can be passed from function to function. <coughs> you can guarantee that. Then you'll understand this thing we call LabVIEW. That's what LabVIEW is. And I'll show you a demo of LabVIEW in just a minute. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is LabVIEW, from a standpoint, we've uh, we put a new price on it for students, by the way. And you know how hacksaws are $4.99? So you can get LabVIEW for $0 for six months and it's a full-blown thing and use it. If you got 20 bucks in your pocket, you can own it. You can own this thing for it. And you may or may not want to, but just to let you know, we've worked real hard so that students can get things cheap. So I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna start doing some demos. So I talked about the dynamometer, right? We, we mentioned this. And I may be the only guy you'll ever meet. And in my bag, I'm carrying around a roll chassis dynamometer. Yes, it is. And this car that I chose to put on there is a 1972 American Motors Corporation Gremlin. I chose that car because that was my first car. And I know a lot about mechanics because I've worked on it every single week. I had to pull the spark plugs out of it once a month and clean them so that they would keep firing. Have you ever owned a car like that? If you did, you'd know a lot about cars. <laughs> because only could you keep it running if you worked on it. So I, I chose that. I put that on there. But this little guy has two motors. This is the drive motor here. This is the motor that's, that's in the car. Right? I couldn't actually power it with this little guy. So this is the drive motor in the car. This little motor right here gives us rolling resistance, like I'm going up a hill. Did you know this? If you take this little DC motor, you spin it up, and you short out the ends, it will get harder to turn. Did you know that? You should try that out someday. Just go take one motor put a 9-volt battery on it, run it, stick another motor on the other side of it, connect them together. It's running now. Put your voltmeter on it. You'll see it's kicking out voltage. Short the two terminals on that motor together. It'll get harder to turn. That's the basic principles they use at BMW or Ford when they're testing out cars. Well, guess what we can program and try on this thing? Yes, cruise control, right? I can put power into this, and I can, I can oscillate this up and down. No resistance. Deep, heavy resistance, no resistance, heavy resistance, and see if my integral term is tuned or not. I can try that out and I can, I can do it. So that's the first thing. This is, they have a name for a device like this that you would use in a laboratory. They call this a plant. And it took me a long time. I was like, manufacturing plant? Like what kind of, like, you know, a green plant? No, no, it, 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 this is like the third meaning of the, the word plant. It's a small device like this that you could use to actually do some experimental work on, right? It's called a plant. So this is my plant, and we're actually going to run this thing. We're going to use it. Okay, so the second thing we're going to do, I want you guys to see this, and then I'll, I'll pass it around. I talked about targets. When you write a program, you have to run it on something. And the thing that you typically run it on is your computer, right? One of the things about your computer is that you're usually reluctant to go hang it out on the wind turbine or stick it into the corner of the greenhouse and leave it there and come back and see the data that it collected, right? So you're typically not going to use your laptop or even your iPad that way. So they make things called embedded targets, small boards that you're much more likely to, to go and distribute around and use. And you've, you've heard of a bunch of these things. There's something called an Arduino out there. Have you ever heard of this? Arduino is a little computer that you can go and deploy. We made a more expensive type of this thing, but I'll show you what it'll do, and, and it's this little guy. So everything I write in LabVIEW now, all of the mathematics, all of the I.O. that I'm about to do on my computer, I can stick in this box, and it will run by itself without my computer. There's a couple things about it. It's got a multi-core processor in there, a dual-core processor, so that's good. It's got an FPGA in it. So you can actually begin to program an FPGA. I want to tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. It's got wireless in it, so I can actually put it on a network and access it any place. And it has 54 points of I.O. Analog in, analog out, so waveforms in, waveforms out, digital in, digital out, and a bunch of uh, serial bus ins and outs. 
and an advice of this. So we just got done building this. The other thing I want to tell you about the FPGA, like the one that's in here and the other ones that you'll see. Here's how you can think about an FPGA. And this will help you sort of envision why people are excited about them and what they're good for. An FPGA is a sea of transistors. It's just a fabric of a whole bunch of transistors. And they can be connected end to end. They can be connected end to end with all of these different logic gates. So you can say this one and this one, and that one or this one, not this one or that one. That's what they can do. Right? So all of these things can be connected together end to end. And you say, all right, what am I going to do with that? Well, if you connect this one and that one, but not this one or that one, and this one and this one, you can have hundreds of thousands of these connected together, and it will actually map out and create functionality like cruise control by connecting the transistors in these unique patterns end to end. Now, what's so good about that? Well, think about it this way. If you had a bunch of dominoes on a table, and you take one, you space them all out, you, 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 you drop the one. Some of them won't be hit, some of them will. And they'll map out a pattern, and it'll propagate from the start to the end. I'll tell you the number, and you give me the unit of time that you think it takes to start that propagation, to cascade the first domino, to when the last one falls. It's going to be called an iteration or a loop. Okay, so the number is 25. What's the unit of time that you think it'll take from start to finish? Units of time. He said a millisecond. That's too high. It's way faster than that. Next guess. Yes, nanoseconds. 25 nanoseconds later, you will have the answer. And you'll be ready to go again. And 25 nanoseconds later, you'll have done it again. 40 million times a second, that functionality will be repeated with all the conditionals and the cases and the uniqueness of the functionality you defined. Now, guess what's not running down there? Windows is not running down there. There will be no checking of hard disks. There will be no checking of any of the incoming process. None of that stuff. It's just a propagation of transistors mapping out functionality. So when they're taking a laser and they're welding the retina back onto the back of your eye, which they do, this is the technology you want controlling that laser beam. Because it's not going to be interrupted by an operating system. It's very fast. And here's the other thing. It's what they call deterministic in time. Meaning, if that took 25 nanoseconds, that's how long it will take the next time, and the next time, and the next time. It doesn't jitter like other systems do, or to that degree. So that's called a field programmable Gatorade. And that's why everybody's fired up about them. Right? They're very, very reliable, very robust, and extremely fast. And that's one of the technologies we put in this box. And we built this box for students to actually begin to go and build systems and try things. And I'll show you what it looks like from a graphical standpoint. All right, let's plug the dyno into this guy. And I'm going to start hooking stuff up. So I got a bunch of batteries. When you go embedded with stuff, you'll need batteries, right? Or solar panels or something like that. So I'm going to start plugging, plugging things in here. And stuff should start coming to life. So I plug this guy in, and the first thing that'll happen, you'll see some lights that come on here. So you got the orange light and, and, the, and the blue light. When the orange light goes out, it just says this computer, this processor, this multi-core processor is up and running, ready to go. So blue light's on, we're all good to go. I'm just going to set him down there first. The second thing is I got to run this car, and it needs power. So I brought another battery, and that's all this battery's going to do is power this car up. So I'll plug this in, turn him on, and now the system has power. Third thing I have to do is plug in, let's hop out of here, I'm going to start taking all this stuff down. I'm going to plug in my little power source. Uh, he is around here someplace. Here we go. That's good. That's good. This guy. Too many cables. All right. So I'm going to plug into my computer, USB plug. That just went into my, my PC. And then the last one goes into my little gray box. OK, so here we go. As soon as that happens, we're going to see this thing react. Now what we wanted to do was say, as soon as you plug this in through USB, it should find the device, and it did. And I'm going to go and launch this thing called the Getting Started Wizard. So 
the getting started wizard will come up. It finds my device. I'm going to tell it, OK, I like that. And now it'll say, do you want to rename it? Now, interestingly enough, if you rename it, it flashes a new name. It reprograms the name into the device itself. I don't want to rename it, so I'll keep it that. The RIO part stands for reconfigurable I.O. And it's really relating to the reconfigurable nature of an FPGA. So at this point, it comes up and says, we're running. I'm reading something. And if I begin to move the device, you'll see that those little things are moving around on the screen. It turns out that inside that box, we put a sensor, an accelerometer. <coughs> Right? So now when you hit the gas in the car, you'll be able to see how many G-forces you're pulling. And when you hit that pothole, you're like, ooh, I wonder if that damaged anything. You can measure exactly what the G-force was, and then you can surmise. I just don't think the car could, <laughs> could handle that shock. You get, you're getting data. But that's inside the box, and it's running. Uh, it's got some uh, buttons on it, so if I click things. Here, I'll try to hold this up so you can see without dropping that. Um, if I click these buttons here you'll see that the LEDs are turning on and off. So I'm talking to it. It's all good. Real, real basic stuff. All right. I'm going to say, OK, that's good. This is giving me, on the z-axis, a value of 1. Any, 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 any physicists in the room? That's, that's a value of 1 g. It's a measure of force, right? The, the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's what that's telling us. So, one is what I expect. If I go negative on it, you'll see the G goes plus and minus, right? And we're at one right now, so that's all good. So I say next. I'm going to go straight into LabVIEW. I'll click on this. It's going to launch LabVIEW at this point. And we have a version of LabVIEW. This is the same version of LabVIEW that they use in industry. It's just set up with a front uh, panel on it to walk me through my RIA. So I'm going to go ahead and create a project. And I'll, I'll pick a my real project. And it'll actually go start loading in the things that I need to do to connect to this. The first thing you see is that it says, would you like to connect this over a Wi-Fi? This gets interesting. So in systems, when you build a system or you're doing some technology out there, and you say, I want this to be in the fourth building over, you can put this device on the network. And you can just sit here and program it here. And that program will hop over wirelessly into your device, four buildings over, and all the new functionality will be ready to go. Right? So these are the kinds of things we've been working on. So I'll say finish to that, and it's going to go and create all the libraries, all the pieces, put them together, that I need to actually go and run my device. So this will take just a second. And then finally, I'm ready to get started. I'm going to click the right mouse button on this. I'm going to say connect. And at this point, the, my computer is connecting to this computer, and I'm ready to begin programming. And I'm real happy because I get this little green light that says we are now connected to one another. Now we're going to start programming. I'm going to create what's called a virtual instrument. Has anybody seen LabVIEW before? Program. So this will maybe be your first graphical programming experience. And it's good to, to set expectations for what's possible. So as I mentioned, that the, the, the user interface is important and humans in the loop are important. So I'll click the right mouse button. I'll come down here to numeric. And I'm going to pick a dial. I'm going to drop it on here. And now I can go and set values. I can put as many of these up there as I want. I can click the right mouse button. I can say, I need to measure the, uh, the RPMs of this engine. I can drop that down there. I can say it's going to go up to 8,000 RPM. And there's, there's a gauge. I can begin doing this. Um, I want to turn some things on and off. I'll go into Boolean. I'll take a toggle switch. I'll drop this down. And I can find him. Stretch this out. And it turned out that when I started doing this in 1990 and 91, I would drop this on the front panel and I click on it. The whole room would stand up, spontaneously applaud. This was the most incredible thing they had ever seen, I think, in their, in their careers. At that point. Now it's like, yeah, it's just another user interface, right? But the point is, you have to be able to build user interfaces. And then last, I'll show you, I might want to put a graph. I might want a strip chart to show my plethysma graph heartbeat. Or I might want to see the power curves off my engine or whatever I'm building. So I'll put a graph in here, and I might just drop this in. And maybe I can make it all look better, but you get the idea, right? You can build user interfaces. The question is, how do you program this thing? Back behind this is called the diagram. 
we call it a block diagram. Those are the knobs and the gauges and the, 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 the buttons. And if I turn that dial on the front and I get a value of eight, this will give me a value of eight from this node into the program. If I flip that on-off switch and it gives me a true, this will give me a true coming out of this thing in the block diagram. They all relate. If I get a waveform and I send it into this, it'll show up on the front panel. The renter actively and intuitively connected. So now I want to program my device. I click the right mouse button, and I've got all kinds of stuff. I'm going to go right down to the bottom. And this is all the inputs and outputs I told you that you'd have out in the world. In this one right here is that onboard accelerometer. I'm going to choose that function, and I'm going to drop it in. In C code, you might have a function called read.accelerometer with some parentheses and a bunch of numbers in it. In LabVIEW, the function looks like this. I'm going to read the x-axis, right? I'm going to say, OK. It's going to build this for me. And I'm ready to go. Next thing I want to do, when I tip the car, remember 1 plus and minus 1? I don't want it to go minus. So we're going to invoke some advanced mathematics called the absolute value. It's really not that advanced, right? I'm going to pick it. I'm going to drop it in right here. And I'll take the output of the accelerometer, whatever it is, that's a spool of wire right there, and now it's not going to be negative anymore. It'll only ever be positive. My output wants a value 0 to 10. I was getting G readings, hopefully, from minus 1 to 1. So I need to multiply it by 10 because I need to output 10 to this thing. So. I'll go down to mathematics again. I'll get a multiply. I'll drop this in. Create a constant. And I'll multiply it by 10. Now I've got a value of 10 coming out of this thing. Does that make sense? Simple little program. Now I need to output it out to the car. Click the right mouse button. Come back down to my Rio. Analog output. I'll drop this in. And it's going to let me choose the outputs. I've got eight channels on this device. I just happen to know it's on the third port, the first channel. I'm going to choose that. So there's, this is basically the fundamentals of my program. It drops it in. I'll take the output from the accelerometer now. I'll output it to the car. And I'm all connected up. Notice I'm not even using these. I haven't really hooked the user interface in. The gauge might be nice. So let's take whatever the value is that's coming out of here and wire into the gauge. Now that gauge will show up and show me what that value is. It's actually going to operate now and work. The last thing I want to do, and you'll see this in every programming language. If I run this, it'll do all of that stuff one time. I want it to do it over and over and over again. That's called a loop. You'll see things like for loops and while loops, all different timed loops, all kinds of loops. I'm going to show you one that I'll pick right here. So this loop. It's called a while loop. And if I take this, I'm going to put it right around here. Now it's in a loop. Everything inside here will operate until on the front panel I push the stop button. Does that make sense? We're ready to run. I'm going to run this thing. Let's go over here. I'll hit the run button. Everything's connected. And it's going to say save it. Yes, I'll save it. Call it that. I called it that. It's all good. And it's downloading it into the program now into this box, that program is being downloaded. And it's all in there. And this is where I always worry. Because if I've done it all right, everything should work. If I've done it right. Hopefully. And obviously, I haven't done it right. That's, all, that's so awesome. So now I'm going to go troubleshoot and see what's happening. That's pretty interesting. So if I hit, this, hit the stop button, this, this, now you guys get to troubleshoot this. With, this is it. Interestingly enough, my gauge was going to 8,000, so I only want him to go to 10, right? So there's my output. See that? OK, when I start tipping this, I'm actually seeing an output. So now I believe that's all good. Oh, I think I see part of the problem. This guy's not on. Well, at least I can troubleshoot it. I've got an LED here that's not lighting up, and I don't know why. So. Oh, I just saw a blue light. There we go. Let's try again. There we go. Okay, sure enough. Remember, as I tilt it now, it's outputting higher and higher values to the car. That's max speed. Right. And 
and you can see the gauge there. Now, do you see that thing jumping around, the gauge jumping around? Why is it jumping so much? It's an accelerometer. And this car is actually jumping, and it's actually reading that at that rate. We can see it. Remember the capacitors I talked to you about? We could drop one of those in the circuit board. It would clean that up. Or I could actually build a, a software-based filter and drop it in there, and you'd see that smooth way out. Averaging, in, like, did you remember the statistical value called the median? It actually has value now. You can take all those readings, take the outliers and throw them away, take the one in the middle. And it doesn't matter if that outlier is at 100, just throw it away, take the one in the middle. The median, the statistical term that they crammed into you into some math class, is highly useful as a filter, highly useful. We could do that there. I want to do one last thing. I'm going to come over to my project. And this is the reason why I wanted a processor in this box. If I click the right mouse button, I'll come down here and say disconnect. Okay. Now it's disconnected. I'm going to pull this wire out of here. Right? I've got a bunch of batteries. I'm precariously wireless at this point, however I'm wireless. And the program we wrote, right, still run. And it was absolute value, remember that? Means it ought to run this way. Right? There's a couple other things. Any of the math that you can think of, we talked about math early on. If I wanted this to not turn very much until I got it all the way down, I could do y equals x squared. I could drop that in the middle. And now the output wouldn't really go until I turned it down there. Any mathematical function you can contrive or dream of, any one possible, you could download into this box. And then the output of this car would behave as mapped out by that function. So now you just go on the hunt for the type of functions that would allow you to play around with that. I think it, so I'm going to pass this around. You're going to have, if you push, if you pull a plug, or you hit a button, you'll shut it off. And then we'd have to reload it. So, so just try to hold on to those. But you'll get the idea. I just want you to see that's running. Yep. Gives you an idea. OK. All right, so let's just finish up. We saw that you. We, we built our own program, so you got, you got a, a sense of what that was all about. LabVIEW can do all kinds of things like case statements and switches, anything you can program. LabVIEW doesn't require you to get down and know all those details. You can even program the FPGA this way. In fact, you can write all the functions I talked about. You can download it into that FPGA. This would be your programming language. This is exactly what it would look like. You can do that with a box like that. And we talked about user interfaces and functions. Here's a user interface. This is one that's done with a little more time than I took. But you get the idea, right? You could build some pretty nice user interfaces to connect to things. And then building systems, right? This is a version of that little dyno that you're seeing there. Um, this was a bigger version of it, right? But you see the plastic gears down there? Those were all cut out on the laser cutter. And we had just hundreds of them. When we decided not to build this anymore, we had like hundreds of these gears because we got happy that we could just cut them out and now we don't know what to do with them. So they're just all sitting around. And this is the plethysma graph that I showed you, right? So real simple. But this thing, this thing, you stick your finger in there, you'll see your heartbeat, right? It's real simple. You can almost see it. Right here embedded inside are the electronics. We stuck them in there before we poured the the alumalite in, the thermal cast resin, and now they're just in, encased in there and pretty rugged. You know. Then applications. So the, the thing I'll leave you with is where technology is taking us. And I just want to give you some wow factor about what people are doing out there and what you can kind of expect and get involved into any degree that you want, any degree that you want. So right here, this is a scan of somebody who has a tumor. That's a tumor. That's a bad thing right there. What they're doing is they're taking beams from the the technology that they're using, actually CERN is part of this. Um, it's not the actual Hadron Collider, but a smaller particle accelerator. And they're shooting things in 
to the tumor. They actually take, I think they take protons and some of this, like a bowling ball. They're sending it in there, blasting the, the, that tumor out of there. And other things they do is um, just with ionizing radiation, where they go in and, and they're actually just killing off the cells of that thing. And then they turn you over and then they shoot the beam this way. They turn you in three different places and they shoot it in different things. But what they have to do is get the right beam energy so that it goes the right depth. They don't want to blast tissue on the other side. So they get the right depth on this, right? And then they control the width of that beam. And then they keep going in and they map this thing out and then they turn you and then they map it out again at different depths and they can, they can map this entire thing out and they can treat tumors this way. This thing has 300 different beam configurations, has to be remapped every 250 milliseconds. And they're doing it, actually they're using LabVIEW to do that. This is something called optical coherence uh, tomography and to, to just quickly tell you about this, I won't get into all of that. This is what the system looks like. But I want to tell you what they're doing. This is incredible. They take an LED with what they call a coherent light source, and it's also um, a broad spectrum, meaning all the light frequencies are in there. And certain light frequencies, like red, will penetrate to different light frequencies than blue will. They go down, they come back up. When they come back up, they can detect each one of those frequencies, and they sample them 60 million times every second over 256 different channels. They bring those out, they read them all in, they do mathematics on them. Remember that dynamic signal analyzer I showed you with the spike at the frequency? The same routine called the fast Fourier transform, they're running on those light frequencies. They feed them over to, yes, the mighty FPGA, and they actually conduct 1.5 million calculations of the frequency conversions every second every single second with the FPGA. They send it over to a Dell octal core computer with a graphics processor in it, and they can scan this over your tissue, and they can see four by four by four millimeters at 23 micron resolution. They can see cancer cells. They can see the blood coursing through veins. If they see something interesting, they can optically slice it and, and look at it in real time. While they're moving this over, they can see all that and all that processing is going. It's unbelievable where technology is taking us. So the expectations, you understand the ensemble is a function. Expectations are high, but it's all out there. You can do this. And this is what it looks like, optically bisecting these. This is a heart wrap. When your heart's failing, they can put a wrap around your heart, have the pressure between the wrap and the heart, and they can actually apply the right forces to keep your heart going. And this is research they're doing at Leeds University. And this freezes an atom, sodium atom. They can hold for a minute. They fire into the sodium atom photons. They blink. They come back off. We can detect that statistically. And you can see the migration of where the atom is going. And then you change the electric field to hold it in place. And that's what it looks like. It's pretty incredible. And this thing right here, when you go out to sea and you're trying to mount one of these wind turbines in high seas, in a high wave condition, you'll walk out on the gangway. You don't want it to become a gang flank. You walk out on the gangway, and it starts moving up and down, and holds that thing perfectly on the tower while the boat's moving underneath it. It's hydraulically actuated to do noise cancellation of the waves. I'm looking forward to that when you put it on uh, the, the business class seats on the airplane. Right? Cancel out the turbulence. That's what it looks like. It's unbelievable. And people are building things all over the place at universities. So, this is my last slide. We've gone through a lot together today. But I wanted to give you an idea of what's possible. We started among the most basic things from materials, right? We looked at LEDs, talked about how to blow those up. You go through all of this stuff and you begin to realize it's out there. Mathematics is critical. But the other thing I'll tell you is you have your professors. They know this theory. They know the details. Every piece of information is a tool that you could and likely will use in the things that you build. So make use of their time and their knowledge. And be curious. And I encourage you to try things. Get little things. Ask them, where do people use that? How, you know, I, I remember somebody talking about the, the two-dimensional inverse FFT. Inverse two-dimensional fast Fourier transform, and I'm like, 
come on, seriously. When will I ever use that? Next time you go get a CAT scan, that's exactly what they're using. So the, the usefulness and the relevance of the mathematics and the theory, ask the questions. Where do they use that? Is there a way for me to experience that? Because if you experience it, you'll remember it. So I'd like to thank you. It's been a lot of fun. We talked about this, uh, this, this presentation for some time, and it really was my pleasure to come out here. So thank you, and I'll take any questions that you have. Thanks. Thank you. Why gas cars are still used today, and why that's never advanced? That's a great question. So why are we still using internal combustion engines, and why haven't we that advanced? There, there's a bunch of reasons. One is that maybe one of the easiest things to do, seemingly, is to dig a hole in the ground and get oil out. You know, did you ever think, like, how did they ever discover that? Because they talk about digging these really deep wells to get stuff. How did they ever discover oil? Well, you know, it was laying on the ground in places. They'd run across it, they'd trip over it. You know, here it was. And then somebody discovered that, wow, this stuff burns and we could use it. So the accessibility of it was, was pretty straightforward, at least at first. <coughs> and a ton of infrastructure built to actually go and get it, right? And we refine it, and that's a bunch of work. But, but in the whole scheme of things, it's relatively straightforward. We know how to do it. And then all the gas stations that popped up. So the infrastructure exists to deliver this stuff from the ground straight to your gas tank. So, so that's one. Second reason is the energy density in gasoline and in oil is unbelievable. Most of that energy that you get on a gallon of gas, you're wasting it. It's going out in heat and in using friction. You know, that's where it's all going. Some of it actually propels you down the road, right? So the energy density is unreal that comes out of that. And what's kind of weird about gasoline, you know, you fill up and you've got, what, you know, 15 gallons in your tank, and it's, you know, you know it's, what, how much is it, five pounds or six pounds a gallon or something? So it's pretty heavy moving around. But as you go, you use it, and you're actually getting more efficient sort of as you move along, right? So there's that aspect of it. It's just really convenient. It's very convenient, and, and it has been, and when it became less convenient, and we had to actually drill under the Gulf of Mexico, and, like, and you know what happened there, right? Well, we, we were already invested, and we just developed the technologies, and we kept going. So the economics of it work out. Now, the other side of it, the other issues with it, are really, really difficult. So I sort of feel like until we get a convenient, viable energy source, People just kind of keep burning that stuff. And that's why it's real important to make progress because you're, you're really answering an economic viability question. You know? And the last thing I'll leave with you uh, on that was, I remember I was in, uh, I think it was in Kosovo, and we are driving, and somebody, you know, Kosovo's had tough times, and they're, they're rebuilding now, and it's really nice what they're doing there. But there was a guy in a big diesel uh, caterpillar, and he's, he's actually clearing ground and stuff, and you know, the big smoke plumes are coming out, and you're thinking, wow. it's like. It's not about anything at that point other than reconstruction and surviving and working. So to that person, we have to give something that's a viable alternative because their need to do that work and survive and rebuild is paramount to them. And you totally have to get that. So we owe an answer other than you just can't drive cars anymore. <laughs> that's not going to work. You can't drive bulldozers. That's not going to work. We have to invent and we have to, we have to move forward. And that's why I think it's still around. And that's why I think it's really important for, for us to invent to move forward. Great question. Thank you.